Welcome back to Domain 4 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And here in Section 4.6, we'll focus on identity and access management. We'll begin with a discussion of some identity lifecycle topics before we dive into a collection of concepts from identity proofing and federation to single sign-on and multi-factor authentication. We will discuss a number of access control models before wrapping our session with a discussion of privileged access management and PAM tooling. Identity is at the center of Zero Trust Architecture, absolutely key information on the job and on the exam. Let's dig in. Welcome back to the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition. And in our continuing coverage of Domain 4, we're up to Section 4.6, which focuses on identity and access management. And here the syllabus challenges us, given a scenario, implement and maintain identity and access management. We'll start with a look at some identity lifecycle topics like provisioning and deprovisioning, permissions and identity proofing. Then we're going to pivot and look at a number of functional and architecture topics like federation, single sign-on, interoperability, attestation, access controls, MFA, and we'll get in the weeds on the factors in multi-factor authentication. Password concepts, easy topic and should be a freebie for you. And we'll wrap up with privileged access management tools. All modern concepts we see in the cloud here, so very likely to appear on the exam, I'd say. So let's start with provisioning and deprovisioning. Provisioning is where our life cycle begins, creating new user accounts with appropriate access levels based on their job function at onboarding. And this is often automated or templated for efficiency and accuracy. So whether it's scripted automation or a template user that the admin is copying really depends on the identity platform, not important for our purposes. And we're provisioning with least privilege access and identity proofing will be part of the process. We'll dig into proofing here in a moment. And the identity lifecycle ends with deprovisioning, so disabling or deleting user accounts when employment ends or roles change. And this, of course, prevents unauthorized access after someone leaves the company. So immediately deprovisioning at separation is important. If we wait four hours, 12 hours, or a week, that employee, even though they're separated from the company, has unauthorized access for a time, potentially. So let's move on to permission assignment. The three primary methods of, of assignment would include assigning direct to the user, which can still ensure least privilege assignment of permissions. This does create more work and it actually increases the risk of permissions creep and increases our management effort when users change roles. Because now we have to go back and touch that user account, give them permissions and remove previous permissions, which can be some work to unwind and figure out. Now, if we assign permissions to groups and then simply add users or remove users from groups, that gives us a way to simplify permission management for sets of users with similar needs. And it's certainly much more efficient than direct assignment to users. And then our third approach is with roles. Roles are defined by the tasks or responsibility a user has within the organization. So with a group, I'm putting a bunch of users into a collection and then I have to assign all the permissions. A role is typically pre-scoped with the permissions for specific tasks or responsibility based on that user's job-related tasks. So let me just show you what I mean here as an example. So I'm looking at Entra ID, formerly Azure Active Directory. This is the identity platform for Office 365. Now let's look at the properties for Adele here, one of our employees, and I can look at her assigned roles and I can add new role assignments, but look at the role options here. So I can pick the Attribute log reader, which can read audit logs related to custom security attributes. The permissions are already assigned. If I dropped Adele into a group or a bunch of users into a group, I would have to configure those rights. And on this particular platform, as I scroll down the list, I see billing administrator, directory readers and writers, exchange, so email-based administration, edge, so browser-based tasks. There's a huge variety here, and on platforms where I can assign a role to a group, I can then gain that extra benefit. I get the efficiency of assigning those permissions one time to a group, but now I don't have to go configure 
the permissions on that group manually. It's done for me in an easier fashion by simply selecting the appropriate roles. And roles are very common on cloud platforms, but it offers a more functional approach to permission management. It's a more dynamic and flexible approach versus groups, and I would argue more accurate most times. We're going to move on to identity proofing, and I want to first talk to you about a related concept, and that's knowledge-based authentication, which pretty often plays a role in the identity proofing process. It's often used by banks and financial institutions or even email providers to identify someone when they want a password reset. And there are two major types of knowledge-based auth. There's dynamic and static, and they have their strengths and weaknesses. So static knowledge-based authentication is where there are questions that are common to the user. For example, what's the name of your first school? Which isn't bad, but that is potentially information that an attacker could go out and find. Now, dynamic is deemed more secure because they do not consist of questions provided beforehand. For example, the bank might ask that user to confirm their identity by specifying three direct debit mandates they've put onto their account, the date and the amount paid. So essentially asking them to go into their transaction history and to provide information that you couldn't find out on their social media profile, potentially, for example. And knowledge-based authentication is something that may be used to help confirm a new user's identity when they're creating an account for the first time or at onboarding. This is known as identity proofing. It's sometimes referred to as identity verification, two ways to say the same thing. It confirms a person claiming a particular identity is actually who they say they are. And there are actually a few common methods for identity proofing. So document verification, knowledge-based verification using knowledge-based authentication, biometric, so requiring face, thumbprint, etc., or also pretty common is what we'd call out-of-band verification, so using an SMS message, a phone call, or an email. But identity proofing is about verifying that claimed identity, validating any documentation or proof, and matching that identity with 100% certainty, knowing that the user is who they say they are. So let's move on to federation. Identity Federation is a collection of domains that have an established trust. Now, the level of trust may vary, but it typically includes authentication and it almost always includes authorization. And it often includes a number of organizations that have established trust for shared access to a set of common resources. So, for example, you can federate your on-premises environment with cloud identity providers and use this federation for authentication and authorization. So, in this case, the sign-in method ensures that all user authentication occurs on-premises. And in cases where we see the tie back to on-premises, it's often because it allows administrators to implement more rigorous levels of access control. They might use certificates, a key fob, a hard token, or a smart card. But we also see federation today with cloud identity platforms and social identity. So for example, for example, I have a website that authenticates users with identity provider A. Let's say that identity provider is Entra ID. That's my platform. That's the platform that's used by Office 365 by default. But this is a business to consumer website, so I'd like to allow my users to authenticate with their preferred social identity. So let's say I have users that authenticate typically with Facebook across many services. They want to use their Facebook ID. So what I can do is federate here. I can create a trust from identity provider A from Entra to trust Facebook. So if I were to just look at that in the Entra portal here, so I'll go to the Entra ID portal and I'll go down to external identities and I'll look at their identity providers. And I see here I can configure traditional federation, but it also allows me to add social identities like Google, like Facebook, so I can configure that trust. So the Entra platform trusts Facebook. And that, that's as far as you need to understand, right? So it can be, you know, at that point, shared access because Entra trusts Facebook. And it doesn't have to be cloud. It may be cloud or on-premises. It's cloud in this example. And trust is not always bi-directional. In this case, it's not bi-directional. It's one direction from Entra to Facebook. So in the on-premises scenario, it would be from Entra to my on-premises provider. That's where I'd use that SAML option for configuring traditional federation. Let's move on to single sign-on. So in single sign-on, it means a user doesn't have to sign in to every application they use. 
The user logs in once and that credential is used for multiple applications. You'll sometimes hear single sign-on based authentication systems called modern authentication. Two protocols you'll hear of frequently here in the single sign-on category. We have Security Assertion Markup Language, SAML for short, which is an XML-based open standard data format for exchanging authentication and authorization data between parties. In particular, between an identity provider like Active Directory or Entra ID and a service provider, the app or the service that the user is authenticating to. SAML pretty often comes up in on-premises federation scenarios. In fact, we saw SAML as an option in the Entra ID portal, which would be the gateway to establishing federation with our on-premises environment via SAML. And then we have OAuth 2.0, that stands for open authorization. So it's an open standard for authorization commonly used as a way for internet users to log into third-party websites using their social identities without exposing their password. Today, you almost certainly log in to one or more sites using your Facebook, Google, Twitter, or Microsoft account. And it's almost certainly open authorization behind the scenes that's facilitating the authorization to that third-party website. So next we see LDAP mentioned in the syllabus. This is really a reference to directory services, which are used to store, retrieve, and manage information about objects like user accounts, computer accounts, mail accounts, and information on other resources. LDAP is a common protocol for a directory service. In fact, it's used by Microsoft's Active Directory, which I suspect you may have heard of. So LDAP is Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And that's part of the solution. We also need to authenticate users. So we couple that directory service with an authentication service to authenticate entities like users and computers. One such example is Kerberos, which is a protocol for authentication also used by Microsoft's Active Directory. Because Active Directory is the most widely used directory service in the enterprise, we should cover it for just a minute here. So it's a set of directory services developed by Microsoft as part of Windows 2000 for on-premises domain-based network. So what that means is that it gives organizations the ability to manage multiple on-premises infrastructure components and systems using a single identity per user, rather than requiring users to have a local login for each server where they wanted to access resources. Now it's worth mentioning that Active Directory doesn't natively support mobile devices, SaaS or line of business applications that require modern authentication. But as Microsoft has scaled into the cloud with Office 365 and Azure Active Directory and hybrid cloud and hybrid identity, they've built in support for all of these components in the enterprise. And an AD domain can scale from a single server, which is called a domain controller, into hundreds of servers as the organization grows and needs to scale. The domain controller has a copy of the directory and it can also authenticate users and we can place those domain controllers wherever we need to throughout our corporate offices. So users in our branch locations can authenticate even if they can't get back to the main office. So to explain Kerberos simply, it's the authentication protocol for an active directory domain. And to access a service, the client requests an authentication ticket. An authentication server checks the client's credentials and responds with a ticket. And when the client wants to use a service, it presents the ticket to request resource access. And it's certainly a bit more complex than that, but you don't need to get into those details for this exam. Do know that Kerberos prevents replay attacks, credential replay attacks, by using timestamps ensuring that authentication messages are fresh and haven't been intercepted and reused or replayed by an attacker. Next on the syllabus, we see interoperability. So in the context of identity management, interoperability is about ensuring identity providers and applications can work together seamlessly. Absolutely critical in federation and single sign-on scenarios. Next on the list, we see attestation. So one of the conditions to access corporate resources may require that the access request originates from an approved managed device. 
Attestation is the process of confirming the device, laptop, mobile device, desktop, whatever, is an approved device compliant with company policies. Remote attestation involves checks that occur on a local device and are reported to a verification server, as with a mobile device management solution. Generally, this includes validation of a unique identifier for the hardware that confirms the device is known. Device attestation is very common in Zero Trust architecture and so common today. It's been a couple of years since I've worked with a client that didn't have it in place on all their endpoints. So it all starts with a hardware root of trust. We're going to talk through the basis for developing that device attestation. So hardware root of trust is a line of defense against executing unauthorized firmware on a system. And when certificates are used in full disk encryption, they use a hardware root of trust for key storage. It verifies that the keys match before the secure boot process takes place. A trusted platform module, or TPM, is an implementation of a hardware root of trust. Let's talk about that TPM for a moment. So the TPM, a trusted platform module, is a chip that resides on the motherboard of the device. It's multi-purpose, like storage and management of keys used for full disk encryption and secure boot. So when I say full disk encryption, I'm talking about BitLocker on Windows, DMCrypt on Linux. But it provides the operating system with access to keys and it prevents anyone from removing the drive and then accessing the data later because the keys to access that encrypted drive are on the chip on the motherboard. At the end of the day, I can remove a drive from a system protected with full disk encryption. And if I don't have access to those keys in the chip on the motherboard, I'm not getting to that data. So for the exam, you should know that the TPM provides secure storage of cryptographic keys to support the secure boot and full disk encryption processes. So moving on, let's talk about access control. And there are a few models you should be familiar with. First, we have non-discretionary access control, which enables enforcement of system-wide restrictions that override object-specific access control. Next, we have discretionary access control. Now, a key characteristic of this model is every object has an owner, and that owner can grant or deny access to any other subject. Let me clarify a couple of things. So this is naturally use-based, it's user-centric as we see, but object and subject can be confusing. So object refers to a resource one might try to access like a file, and a subject refers to a user. An example of this model is the NTFS file system on Windows that we use to secure access to files and folders on the operating system. Next we have role-based access control, or RBAC for short, where user accounts are placed in roles or groups, and admins assign access through roles and groups rather than to users directly, and they're typically mapping to job roles when they choose those permissions, so they can implement least privilege access. And RBAC is considered non-discretionary, by the way, because once that user has been assigned permission through membership in a role or a group. They cannot, at their own discretion, change their permissions. And we have rule-based access control. So the key characteristics here are that it applies global rules that apply to all subjects. Rules within this model are sometimes called restrictions or filters. The perfect example of rule-based access control are firewall rules. So firewall uses rules that allow or block traffic to all users equally. And those rules are rolled up into what are called access lists or access control lists. I want to take a quick sidebar with you here and talk about NTFS permissions. It does get called out in the official study guide and it's a good example from the real world. So NTFS permissions are applied to every file and folder stored on a volume with an NTFS file system in Windows. So you'll see the interface where you have groups and usernames and then permissions down below. So if you've used this in Windows before, what you're using there is a discretionary access control system. Every file and folder has a discretionary access control list or a DACL. And that DACL is a list of access control entries. What we'd call a rule on a firewall.
So discretionary access control specifies every object will have an owner who has full control. And our next model is mandatory access control. This is a model in which every object and every subject has one or more labels. These labels are predefined and the system determines access based on assigned labels. And finally, we have attribute-based access control. In this model, access is restricted based on an attribute on the account, like department, location, or some functional designation. So for example, admin may require user accounts have the legal department attribute to view contracts, or the HR department attribute to view HR information. And still here in the access controls category, we have time-based logins, which may be established for users based on a role where a company may have many different shift patterns and they don't wish for employees to access their network outside of their normal working hours. For example, employees might be restricted to accessing the network between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this type of policy can prevent data theft by preventing users from coming in at 3 a.m. when nobody's watching and stealing corporate data. It can also be effective in preventing individual fraud as well as collusion, where two or more individuals collaborate on a fraud, by enforcing restrictions of schedule rotations. And I see time-based login controls implemented in some industries, like financial services, where you have shift workers in sensitive roles. Last up in the access controls category, we have least privilege. So a subject should only be given privileges necessary to complete their job-related tasks. And this can prevent or limit the scope of security incidents and data theft. Hand-in-hand -hand with least privilege is need to know. So this is where data access is restricted unless one has a specific need to know, meaning access to the information must be necessary for one to conduct their official duties. Otherwise, it results in a user being denied access even if they have security clearance. So these two go hand in hand. And need to know is really just implementing least privilege to a greater degree. Together they limit access to data and systems so users only have access to what they require. It can prevent security incidents and when there are incidents it can limit the scope of those issues. And when you don't follow these principles it can result in far greater damage in the event of a security incident. Now let's move on to multi-factor authentication. So MFA works by requiring two or more of the following authentication methods. Something you know, like a PIN or a password. Something you have, like a trusted device. Or something you are, biometric, face, or thumbprint. If you have a late model iPhone, you're almost certainly using facial recognition, and if you have an Android phone, maybe an older model, you might still be using a finger or thumbprint. But we have a number of options available to us. You know, certainly the Authenticator app we can put on our mobile devices, which can be locked with biometric authentication. Voice call and text messages a bit less desirable. We talked about relying on stronger methods. We'll talk about authentication tokens later in this session. And if you look at the syllabus, you'll actually see a fourth item on there in the MFA factors area. And that is somewhere you are, your expected location, like the company office, your home, or your home city. With modern identity platforms, we can configure dynamic authentication that evaluates the conditions of the access attempt. And when you're in an unexpected location, that raises a risk factor, and we can then pivot and perhaps require an additional factor a strong second factor. And there are certainly a wide variety of attributes or, or factors we can implement in a number of specific situations. Something you can do, such as writing your signature, for example. Something you exhibit, the personalized manner you perform an action, such as your gait, the way you walk. Or someone, you know, responding to a challenge with knowledge of a characteristic of a specific individual, you know. So let's talk about biometrics for a moment. This is a method of authentication using an individual's physical characteristics, which of course are unique to the individual. Fingerprint scanners are now very common and used not only in MFA, but various travel, financial, and legal situations. And of course, many smartphones today have fingerprint capabilities built in. 
Retina scanner. With appropriate lighting, the retina can be accurately identified as the blood vessels of the retina absorb light more readily than the surrounding tissue. Also focused on the eye is the iris scanner. So both retina scanners and iris scanners are physical devices, generally speaking. And voice recognition. So voice patterns can be stored in a database and used for authentication. And a couple of other relatively uncommon methods would include vein. So using blood vessels in the palm can be used as a biometric factor of authentication. Or gait analysis, which is the way an individual walks. So identification or authentication using gait is possible even with lower resolution video. Biometric authentication is common today. Not all of these methods, obviously. But some may still raise privacy concerns with employees that should be addressed. And I wanted to say facial recognition for last, so this looks at the shape of the face and characteristics like the mouth, jaw, cheekbone, and nose. And here light and angle and direction can be a factor, especially in software. And I bring all this up because it's going to become increasingly common, I think. So facial recognition in Windows, called Windows Hello, was released with Windows 10, and it uses a special USB infrared camera, and as such is better than other facial recognition programs that can have problems with light. Though I will say Windows Hello had its own problems early on. But I think generally speaking, because we have facial recognition on an iPhone and we have fingerprint on many smartphones, these are two forms of biometrics that folks are relatively unalarmed in using in most cases, in my experience. There are also some details around errors in biometric authentication you should be familiar with for the exam. The key metric for errors in biometric is the crossover error rate. So your biometric methods identify users based on their physical characteristics, and the crossover error rate identifies the accuracy of a biometric method. Specifically, it shows where the false rejection rate is equal to the false acceptance rate. And if you want to move the crossover error rate higher or lower, you can increase or decrease the sensitivity of your biometric device. Let's go a bit further on false rejection and false acceptance. False acceptance occurs when an invalid subject is authenticated. This is sometimes called a false positive authentication. A false rejection occurs when a valid subject is rejected. This is sometimes called a false negative authentication. False acceptance is also called a type 2 error. False rejection, a type 1 error. And false rejection is certainly undesirable, but false acceptance is worse. If a biometric system falsely rejects someone who should have access, we can correct that. If a biometric system falsely grants access to someone who should not have access, that's harder to walk back and it may result in damage we can't undo. And for the exam, I would also remember that the acronym FAR is false acceptance rate and FRR is false rejection rate. Now we're going to move on to hard and soft tokens. There are a couple of concepts we need to get out of the way first, so hard and soft tokens fully make sense. The first is the HMAC-based one-time password, which uses a key hashed message authentication code or an HMAC. It relies on two pieces of information. The seed, which is a secret known only by the token and a validating server, and the second is a moving factor, a counter. And similar, we have the time-based one-time password. It's based on the HMAC concept, but where the moving factor is time instead of a counter. And it uses time in increments called the time step, which is usually 30 or 60 seconds. And each one-time password is valid for the duration of the time step. If you've ever used an authenticator app, the Google Authenticator or the Microsoft Authenticator, and you have that six-digit code that rotates every few seconds, that's a time-based one-time password. One more supporting concept, and then we'll get down to business. So what is an oath token, and how does it work? Well... OATH stands for Open Authentication. It's an open standard that specifies how time-based one-time password codes are generated. I don't expect you're going to see OATH in a question on the exam, but 
That brings us to soft authentication tokens. They are typically applications. The Authenticator app from Microsoft, for example, that gives you those one-time passwords, that's technically a soft authentication token. Then we have hard authentication tokens, which are small hardware devices. They look like a key fob. They display a code that refreshes every 30 or 60 seconds with the secret key or seed pre-programmed into the device. So I want to touch on the most common version of the software or soft token. That's in an authentication application, more commonly known as an authenticator app. So it's a software-based authenticator that implements two-step verification services using either the time-based one-time password algorithm or the HMAC-based one-time password algorithm. And it's used for authenticating users of software applications. The two most common examples that come to mind are the Microsoft Authenticator and the Google Authenticator. And both the Microsoft and Google Authenticator generate their one-time passwords following the OATH standard. And when you're out in the real world working with these, you'll sometimes hear HMAC and the time-based one-time tokens called OATH tokens with some of these providers. I know Microsoft calls them OATH tokens for sure. Uh, push notifications. This is where the server is pushing down the authentication information to your mobile device. It uses the mobile device app to be able to receive the pushed message and display the authentication information. And as you're likely already aware, these apps are available on iOS and Android through their app stores. Next, we have the security key, which looks like a USB device. It works in conjunction with your password to provide multi-factor authentication. One example of a security key is the Yuba key, which is a FIPS 140-2 validation that provides code storage within a tamper-proof container. The syllabus also calls out password best practices. These should be pretty easy for you. So we have complexity, so complex passwords, sometimes known as strong passwords, are formulated using at least three of the following four groups. Lowercase, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. And ideally with all four. Password length, so generally speaking, longer passwords are more secure. Ideally 12 plus characters. So the work factor, the work required to break, to crack a longer password is higher. The next is reuse, which is another way of saying password history. So this prevents someone from reusing the same password. For example, if the number of passwords remembered is 12, only on the 13th change could it be reused. And we'll typically pair that reuse setting with a minimum age. So passwords should have a minimum age so users cannot work around the reuse restriction. So for example, with a history of 12, minimum age of one day means it takes 13 days to return to the original password. Next, we have the password manager. So a password manager is designed to help users create, store, and manage secure passwords. It's stored locally, uses strong encryption, and protects secrets in the vault. And a password manager will typically support storing additional info like expiration, notes, URLs. Examples of password managers include LastPass, KeepPass, 1Password, and your web browsers on Windows and Mac OS, like Chrome and Edge, also provide built-in password managers. So next on the list is passwordless authentication. And I want to talk to you about two common approaches. One is FIDO2. So FIDO2 uses public key or asymmetric cryptography for user authentication. The user has a physical device, usually a USB or NFC type device, and the authentication sequence goes something like this. The user provides their username, they get the cryptographic challenge, they use the FIDO key to sign the challenge, the service then grants them access. So another increasingly common passwordless approach is Windows Hello for Business. Just throwing this out there as another example. At the end of the day, we're trying to reduce users' reliance on passwords, which are the weakest form of authentication. So Windows Hello for Business is built into Windows 10 and it replaces passwords with strong two-factor authentication. So the users can authenticate with a Microsoft account, an Active Directory account, an Entra ID account, Microsoft's cloud identity platform used by Office 365 and Azure. 
Identity Provider Services or FIDO that we discussed just a moment ago. But Windows Hello is the personal version and it uses a pin or biometric gesture. And Windows Hello for Business uses asymmetric keys that are going to be protected on the TPM that require a user gesture, a pin or a biometric to authenticate. So you're going to have multi-factor there essentially. But it replaces password, so it's passwordless, just as is FIDO. So passwordless solves a few problems, and this is what you should most focus on for the exam. Strong passwords can be difficult to remember, and users will often reuse passwords on multiple sites, which means when you have a server breach on one site, it can expose that symmetric network credential, that password. And passwords are also subject to replay attacks, and users can also inadvertently expose their passwords due to phishing attacks. So when we get rid of passwords, users can no longer inadvertently expose their passwords in a phishing attack, so it reduces our phishing exposure. All right, our last section in this session is privileged access management tools. So let's start by defining privileged access management. So PAM, as it's often called, allows an organization to apply more stringent security controls over accounts with elevated privileges, like your admin or root level accounts. And they often employ just-in-time permissions. This is a concept in which administrators request activation of administrative privilege when they are needed. The activation expires after a set period of time, and the privileges are revoked. That time is generally measured in minutes or hours, and users can also, in most of these services, self-revoke so they can indicate that they're done and end that elevation. Next, we have password vaulting, which allows users to access privileged accounts without needing to know a password. It often allows privileged credentials to be checked out as needed, and it ensures that passwords are available for emergencies and outages. Password vaulting is sometimes used with PAM solutions. And last but not least, we have ephemeral credentials. So these automatically expire after a brief period of time, usually just a few minutes. They're commonly used in scenarios where temporary time-bound access is required. Often used in PAM scenarios where short-lived credentials are needed. We need privilege for a short period of time, often a few minutes to maybe a few hours. For the exam, also remember ephemeral credentials enhance security by minimizing the exposure window for unauthorized access. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of section 4.6. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, leave me a comment below the video, reach out directly on LinkedIn. Always happy to help anywhere I can. I'll look forward to seeing you back here in the next day or two for section 4.7. And until next time, take care and stay safe.